Okay, thank you, Pastor Zeni, for the kind words. And um, it is a blessing to have a lot of women in your life. <laughs> yes, it's a real blessing indeed. And anyway, I'd like to welcome you all this morning to, to our wonderful church. Uh, this is the second time preaching this morning. For some reason, I still got a lot of energy. Maybe we should have a third service. Anyway, um, this morning we're, we're starting our, our series on hope. We finished the book of Habakkuk, and now we are focusing on the book of Ephesians. Ephesians, and um, our theme is on hope. And today our theme is Hope for the world. Hope for the world. Hope for the world. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And just hold your thumb there on Ephesians chapter 1. With that being said, I'd just like to invite you all to just bow your heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this, your holy Sabbath day. We thank you, Lord, for um, giving us this opportunity to be able to stand before you and to share your word. And Lord, I'd just like to invite your presence, remove any distractions that we may have this morning, and that, Lord, we may zone in into the word, and the Lord, that the word may speak to us, and that, Lord, by beholding, we become changed. We're living in trying times. And now it's time for us to be serious. So we thank you, Lord, as I pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. This morning I would like to share with you a story that I haven't shared before. Or well, I shared it with those that were here this morning. But this morning I'd like to share with you this story. It's a personal story. You see, growing up in a family of five children... Having both parents in my life, this was something that I cherished so much. A lot of people can re resonate well with that. I couldn't imagine the thought of not having both of my parents, or even losing one parent. You see, I enjoyed the time we spent together, the family holidays, the family trips, the road trips, visiting other family members, and even spending or celebrating uh, special occasions. Despite the, exciting, despite the exciting and fun things we did together, there was one thing that was important that we didn't do as a family, and that was to go to church. We didn't go to church together as a family. As we all know that a family creates strong bonds and have memories of a lifetime when they do things together. But this was not the case. Why me? I've entitled my message this morning, Why Me? I would ask myself when my thoughts and feelings were not in a good space. My father was, my father was a delight in my life but his presence was missing when it came to spiritual matters. We needed him, and I needed him there. I was there. I wish, he, I wish there was a way for him to be there. But that decision rested in his hands. I wish he was more conscious about the life he chose. The reality of the situation would have been us never seeing him again if he had died before giving his life to God. Why me? As I kept asking myself each time, why did my father have interest in spiritual things? Fortunately, there was still hope for, for him because of one thing, and that is grace. He was not so fortunate as he got very ill because he allowed toxins in his body for a very long time. Toxin, toxins, as we know, can cause organ damage over a period if you persist to abuse 
your body that way. Doctors daily see patients suffering from effects of alcohol and substance abuse, and sometimes they must, they must tell bad news that their life will be altered as a result. Now, as one who would uh, easily panic, I asked again, why me? Is he going to die without us have experiencing church together? However, that was the turning point in his life. He found God through that experience. And he was enthusiastic, rich beyond measure, because he was no longer ignorant of the wealth he had in the gospel. Due to the past failures and mistakes, his body didn't come to the point of full healing. So the battle to recovery was very difficult. He had moments of asking himself, why me? I have turned my life around. He later, he later died because his body couldn't handle it. I asked the Lord, why me? He was on the right path to spiritual maturity and encouraging former colleagues about the transforming power of receiving the gospel. He, had he not fully loved you to the point of death, I asked the Lord, how can I be sure that I will see him again? However, the promising thing about the whole experience was that he had found the connection with God and developed an intimate relationship with God. God will be glorified for the transformation of his life. This morning, are you constantly asking yourself, why me? Why do I see no movement in my life or in the loved ones? The letter, the letter to the Ephesians, we learn that if salvation was man-made, we might worry that we will lose it. For mankind, salvation is God's making when he decided to save us when we became his possession we need not fear that he will fulfill his promise and make sure that those that belong to him will not be lost and there is hope in the world when we understand the richness we have in Christ fortunately however there is an answer to the problem you are experiencing today I'd like you to turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1 Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to zone into these three, three four important um, texts, these four, in te four important texts, and we're going to zone into those, and we're going to focus on those texts this morning. From verse 11, verse 11 says, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Verse 13, In him you were also trusted after you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory? You see, my friends, the church in Asia Minor, we are told, the church in Ephesus was strategically placed. Paul addresses them as saints in verse 1 of that same chapter. These people were part of a universal church. In Christ Jesus, these Christians were set apart for God's use. God extended his grace and peace which symbolized his steadfast love for them and the relational state because of that grace. Now, to live in harmony, we are told, uh, with someone requires both parties to be reciprocal uh, towards each other. The people in Ephesus uh, were faithful to Christ Jesus because they had received him into their lives. As Paul addresses himself uh, to the audience of Ephesus, he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. He belonged to Christ because of the transformation that had taken place in his own life. He was a messenger who was authorized by Christ. You see, the interesting thing about it all, Paul did not 
uh, did not self-appoint himself to the position. God selected him. Hence the words, by, by the will of God, are placed, in, are placed with God's unmerited grace and emphasize that there was nothing personal Paul had done to become an apostle of Jesus Christ. Therefore, he was delighted to serve the Lord. You know, this morning as I look into the crowd, I see that there are many people who are delighted to serve the Lord. I know sometimes you come here a bit angry, sad, mad, whatever the case might be. But deep down, I can see that you are delighted to serve the Lord and to know God. Now, as he addresses the Ephesians, they lack spiritual maturity and were ignorant of the amount of spiritual wealth they inherited. They possessed from Christ's adoption into the kingdom, acceptance, inheritance, redemption, forgiveness, and wisdom. Remember, Paul was a Jew. And before the adoption of the Gentiles by Christ, this message would have been only meant for the Jews. Verse 12 tells us. However, the Gentiles became Christians and they had received grace and power from Christ. It was for them to claim it, to embrace it, and to honor it. Growing up, seeing the way my father lived, uh, you stand to wonder if the power of Christ would work on him. Some of us today, we ask, why me? Can the power of God transform my children, my husband, my family member, or even my neighbor? I saw the power of Christ move on a man from dying from a spiritual death to, a, to, to living a spiritual life. It was not by any means, but by the means of Christ and Christ alone. Paul, speaking to the Ephesians, reminds the people, that we who trust, first trusted in Christ should be the praise of his glory. What people think about a person becomes the per, that person's perception, uh, reputation. Sorry, Our lifestyle will demonstrate how highly we think of God, and that in turn will influence others to think highly of God. Destined in the sense that we have the option to follow him without having to sacrifice something, but rather we come to him freely and he will accept us freely. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, as the Bible tells us, the Holy Spirit is the agent that links the sinner with God. The Ephesians had received the Holy Spirit and they knew it. They were not ignorant of the presence of God but the power that they had from receiving Christ. The people trusted in God, as Paul stated. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, of your salvation, you see, this truth was important for understanding of what Christ represented. Jesus himself, in the book of John, chapter 8, verse 32, he says this, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Christ is the truth. And the true meaning of the gospel is through Jesus. The truth cannot be separated with Jesus and the true disciples must be connected to Christ in his truth. Knowing Christ allows us to have freedom. And true freedom is determined by the freedom we experience in Christ. Immersing our minds in Christ will truly liberate us. Immersing ourselves in the word of God will truly liberate us. Spending time with Christ will liberate us. You see, the people in Ephesus who had claimed to be followers had, un had to understand that knowing the truth will be helpful, he helpful and profitable for them to know and be confirmed in the belief of it. Today, as we sit here and listen, and for those that are watching, our belief in God rests on knowing God personally. Not me, mommy, daddy, sister, brother, cousin. God wants to know you personally, individually. A relationship with God is always one-on-one, -on -one, and that is very important. Some of us have been in the church for so long, but we're still in darkness of many, th many things. Perhaps if we do not need to be taught 
then we do not need to be his disciples. Disciples of God are looking for the truth and to understand it as it applies in their lives. Why me is a question that we ask. As some would ask themselves this morning, it is a great privilege to be in truth and understand what truth is and how we are to believe it and what it determines to be in truth, to be true. It is important that the children of God continue to know the truth and to be educated by it. It shapes our whole entire lives when we fully grasp the word of truth. We become better Christians, loving Christians. We stop gossiping. We stop backbiting. And most importantly, we stop sinning. The closer you get to the Lord, the clearer you see who you are. And that is a journey. Have you ever wondered? The more you get into the word, the more you see who you are. And you want to be changed. Well, some run away from it. But Paul, uh, today as we're reading in the book of Hebrews, we're told God has no, has no part in that. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. The more we immerse ourselves in the beautiful words of Christ, the more we become like him. As the elder came to the house every Wednesday evening for Bible study with my father before, after his baptism, we were encouraged to support him by being, in, being part of this Bible study. However, the spirit sometimes would be willing, but your mind would be placed somewhere else. Sitting in the Bible, uh, sit, sitting in the Bible study helped us develop an increased knowledge and understanding of Scripture. Just because we, we were at church every Sabbath, that did not, that did not equate to spiritual richness. We needed that time to get to know him intimately. Accepting the truth in fullness frees us from the, from the appealing sin, allowing us to grow in Christ. As one author say, once said, to know the truth is not to intellectually comprehend, but to experience. The, to know the truth is not to focus on a body of knowledge, but to live in touch with reality as God knows reality. To hold to Jesus' teaching is not a reference to doctrinal, doctrinal purity, but to a commitment to put Jesus' teachings into daily practice. To be free is not to live selfishly, doing whatever one wants whenever one wants, but to live dis a disciplined and godly life when, which releases us from, the, from our bondage to sin so that the choices we make lead to what helps us rather than to what hurts. All this can be found if we're only willing to really be the disciples of Jesus. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit worked on the hearts of the Ephesians. They believed by faith which brought about salvation. Today, we have been presented with truth. We are here because of truth. The Bible studies that we go through Sabbath or, or, or Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever, we're delving into the truth. Because by beholding, we become changed. Today, we have been presented with truth, and there is one directive that comes from God, and that is to preach the gospel, because it is enough to know the truth, but it is important we share it as it enables us to grow spiritually. When we preach the gospel, we are sealed and protected by the Holy Spirit. The Lord, Holy Spirit, God would never allow us as we go out into the field, into the mission field, into the neighborhoods. God would never allow us to go alone. We are accompanied by the Holy Spirit wherever we go. Seek and ye shall find, the Bible tells us. Paul did not want them to forget what God had done for them. And today God does not wish we forget what he has called us to do. You see, I love the Bible, uh, the Bible text in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 to 7. Those two very important verses. This is what it says. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Verse 7, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Those are beautiful words. Can I get an amen? See, the gospel, the euangelion, 
The good news needs to be preached to the world. You see, John describes this to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. While I was working yesterday, you see, my friends, I was working yesterday, and I received a phone call um, from my uncle in England to say, your uncle David has passed away. You see, my uncle David, I was thinking of him because I hadn't spoken to him or seen him for 17 years. And then I received this phone call. As I, was, I was thinking about him the past week, and I said, I wonder how my bro- uncle David is. Because I had just reconnected with my, my Uncle Morris. So I was wondering how he was, his younger brother. But then I got that phone call yesterday and he said, your uncle has passed away. He had um, uh, cancer on the throat. You see, my uncle had lived a life of misery and, uh, misery and no hope. But there is hope for someone out there. Through the preaching of the gospel, someone will find hope because the message to fear God and to give Him glory gives a sense of hope. The gospel is a matter matter of life and death. It is referenced as good news but has consequences for those that reject the message of hope and love and mercy. Fortunately, the Ephesians, they needed to, to be strengthened they needed to strengthen their faith and, rem- and, and have a reminder of what mon- money can buy. The spiritual riches open to them, all the wealth of God's vast creation. They would enjoy the gifts given to them because they knew Christ and his love. There is really no need for us to live in poverty when all God's wealth is at our disposal. And finally, the experience of the Ephesians was that they believed and through their faith brought about salvation. The same God who ordains the end, the salvation of souls, also ordains the means to the end. The preaching of the gospel in the, in the power of the Spirit. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19 says, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His. Let's take, let's take the opportunity to, fu- to be fully equipped or to fully equip ourselves with the resources of heaven so that we give hope to the world that, that is dying in sin and misery. If we look at what is happening out there today, we hear of so many things. People are dying. And the only hope they have is to hear about Jesus Christ. Do we see trouble everywhere? We surely do. We see natural disasters. We see war. We hear of wars. We see, we see that there's war happening in Europe. And calamities are increasing. Uh, we experience flooding here in Brisbane. Sydney is experiencing the same thing. And these are just warning signs. The coming of our Lord is surely upon us. And we need to be like the five wise virgins who had enough to carry them through. We need to be like Daniel who had purpose to follow God regardless. And finally, we need to be like Paul who preached from city to city, preaching the gospel message because he had compassion over them. For us to do the work of God requires love for mankind. Love for God and love for mankind. We cannot do the work of God if we don't have that love. We need to seek the love of God daily. Sometimes we become angry, as I said. Sometimes we become a certain way. But we ask that Lord may transform us and work with our defects of character so that we may be better loving Christians. In conclusion, it had been a year since my father had passed away. I found myself in a very difficult position. He was not present, and my hope was for him, for me to be able to speak with him. And to continue to learn from him. That was not the case because he was gone. See, growing up I was worried of losing someone special. And not being able to do something about it. Sure enough, there was a void that no one could fill. I was empty inside. And I had lost hope. I had family uh, around me, but why me? The only time we could now enjoy the spiritual journey together, could, uh, together was just cut off. 
It was only when I was invited to go to a church camp and I was reminded. I was reminded. And the Holy Spirit rekindled the fire in me. Having heard the gospel, I believed and I began to trust in Christ again. God, in his wisdom, allows things to happen in your life for growth, for his purpose, for his purpose. Sometimes all we need to do is to begin to trust in him. In your spiritual journey this morning, are you struggling to see God's ideal for your life? You've been a Christian probably for about 40, 50 years, maybe two days, or maybe a year or two. Are you struggling to see God's ideal for your life? Has the power of sin overcome you and you're not sure where to go from here? Are you constantly asking yourself, why me? Can I see beyond my circumstance? Have you maybe forgotten the important things to do in life? We can claim God's promises and with confidence through faith to meet all our needs. Do you want to join me today in allowing, my friends, this is an invitation. Do you want to join me today in allowing the Holy Spirit to fill us? By whom we were made spiritually secure. To be mocked with a seal. You know what it means in chapter 7 of Revelation? It, mean, it indicates authority, authenticity, and security. It is a validation of ownership. God seals or mocks his children with the Holy Spirit, indicating that we are his. That we are authentic spiritual children, no fakes or imposters, and that we are under his protection. My, fr my, my beloved friends, my last appeal to you. Do you wish to join in the announcement, which is written in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, which says, Go ye into the, all the, what? the world and preach the gospel to every creature. As Christians, we ought to see ourselves important. The Ephesians had forgotten. My prayer is that we have not forgotten this morning. We are important people called to do a marvelous work. It is not by chance that we are here on this earth God has called us and brought us to work for him. He has invited you. He has drafted us in so that we can be effective tools for the kingdom. Challenges come our way. The devil throws so much at us, but God is asking us for us to get up, rise up, and continue to move forward. Press on forward, my beloved friends. Life is difficult right now. Believe me, there's a better place out there. Promise for us. On that day, I believe I will see my Father in heaven on that sea of glass. He changed. He did a U-turn and never looked back. I would admit to this. Sometimes it became annoying because all he spoke about is church, 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 church. But it was beautiful to see because that is something that we long for. God has invested in our redemption, my beloved friends, and made us significant through Christ. If God's Spirit lives with us, we can live and praise God in truth. The hope of the world is when we prese present Jesus to them and they see Jesus in us. Let's remember, what we have, many are crying for. May the Lord add a blessing to his word.